name of Malcolm Fry, next to my dad, who was one of the most influential men in my life, starting at the age of 14. He's the gentleman who uh, preached my ordination when I was ordained into ministry. And um, he could play the piano and sing, and he's the first time I ever heard that song sung. And so that is a treasure, treasure memory this morning. I invite you if you brought the story. How many of you read the story, chapter 6, this week? Let's see if, oh, you guys are so awesome. Should I ask who didn't? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. If you're busy with us and new, you would have no idea. But I'd like you to take the story, if you would please, and turn to uh, page 71, chapter 6. If you brought a, a regular Bible, we're going to be in Numbers, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, in just a couple of minutes. What Gene just sang about is certainly being evidence to us as we make our journey through the Bible, from the story of Adam and Eve and creation to the fall, and all the way to Noah, which is God's mulligan, giving the world the second chance to get it right, and we couldn't do it even the second time. And then the call of Abraham, who was an old man along with his wife. Uh, I'm sorry, Gene, but Adam, I mean Abraham and Sarah had a problem that other men in our church couldn't take care of. Sarah couldn't get pregnant. They couldn't have a baby. And so, <laughs> and so God wanted it very specifically, Abraham and Sarah, to start a new nation. This was a long-term solution to an old problem. And that was going to be God revealing himself to a chosen people. In the Old Testament, they were called the Israelites. In the New Testament, we are called the church. Who Abraham, by faith, believed and trusted in God and went to a country that he did not know where it was. And God has honored that. And where we are now is in the development of this nation. They grew while in captivity from a, a family of 70 to a nation of millions. God has now delivered them out of Egyptian captivity and he has taken them to the brink of the promised land, a, a country that God is going to give to Israel for the rest of their days on earth. And that's where we'll pick up in just a few minutes this morning. Philip Yancey, a prolific author and a deep Christian thinker, in one of his books called Rumors of Another World, he tells a personal story of living in Colorado. He said, since I live in Colorado, I climb mountains. Colorado has 54 mountains rising above the 14,000 foot mark. And every summer, I climb a few of them. On a summer weekend in the mountains, I see casual hikers who have no idea what they're doing. I see them in sandals, shorts, t-shirts, carrying a single bottle of water, and they start up a trail about mid-morning. They have no map, no compass, no reindeer. They also have no apparent knowledge of the lightning storms that roll in many summer afternoons, make it an imperative to summit before noon and head back for the safety of the timberline around lunchtime. He says, my neighbor who volunteers for Alpine Rescue has told me hair-raising stories of tourists who must be rescued from certain death after they wandered off a trail, after falling, or simply being exposed to a sudden hailstorm or a 30-degree drop in temperature. Nevertheless, regardless of the circumstances or conditions, Alpine Rescue always responds to the call for help. Not once, not once have they lectured a hapless tourist saying, well, since you obviously ignored the most basic principles of wilderness, you'll just have to sit here and bear the consequences. We'll get you later. <clears throat> They've never done that. You see, their mission is rescue. And so they pursue every needy hiker in the wilderness, no matter how undeserving they might be. A whistle, a yell, a flashy mirror, a bonfire, an SOS spelled out in high branches, a message of distress from a cell phone. Any of these signals will cause Alpine Rescue to mobilize teams of medically trained searchers. <coughs> I've come to discover that the central message of the Bible is also one of rescue. From Adam and Eve's first sin, <coughs> God come to rescue us. In the book of Romans, Paul takes pains to point out that there's not a one of us that deserves God's mercy, 
And there is none of us who can save ourselves. Like a stranded hiker, all any of us can do is signal for help. And any signal we send, God hears and God comes. A hardened park ranger might look at the efforts of Alpine Rescue as indulging the bad habits of irresponsible tourists. Can you see a ranger say, what we ought to be doing is rewarding the good hikers and forget those guys who don't follow the rules? Reminds me a little of the Pharisees out of the New Testament who used to say in their prayers in public places, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other folks, thieves and robbers and adulterers and evildoers. Thank you that I'm not like them. <laughs> That's not the way God works. God sent his son to rescue us. And when his son hung on that cross, he became every thief, he became every robber, he became every adulterer, he became every evildoer. For the scripture says, he who knew no sin became sin itself, so that we who were sinners could now become the righteousness of God. An incredible free gift that rescues us from the destruction of our own behavior. Yancey posed such a question to his neighbor. Why don't you lecture them? Why don't you ignore them? She looked at Yancey uncomprehending. She said, sir, our business is rescue. Do you expect us to leave any hiker in the wilderness? I don't care who they are. They need our help. And in the same way, Jesus says, I tell you, there is great rejoicing amongst the angels in heaven over one sinner who repents. Over every rescue that God accomplishes, they throw a party in heaven. And this is the story of the Bible. A God who pursues so he can have a relationship with us. A God who rescues so we can have a promise of an eternal home. Can you imagine what it would have been like for 80-year-old Moses leading a 2 million-plus population out of Egypt to the Promised Land, through the desert? Can you try to, try to imagine all of the statistical things that would happen? Any of you just try to get a family of four them to go to the airport? <laughs> Think now, 2 million, all having to have breakfast, having to have things packed, Having to be ready to go. All at the, that's like herding cats. Absolutely. Horrible. <laughs> Moses with two million kids on a road trip saying, Are we there yet? Don't touch me. The hard thing about road trips is the fussing and the fighting and the endless questions. Another hard thing about road trips is taking a wrong turn or getting off on the, the wrong exit and heading to a different destination. Every road trip includes a destination as well as the journey across the terrain. In the 21st century, we are grateful we've got GPS today. Global Positioning Satellite. It helps us as we travel most of the time. There are some flaws. Like trying to get to the local community church by GPS, it will put you out by Columbus Community Hospital. It's not errorless, all right? But it does help a lot. I am so grateful that ever since the beginning of time, there has been GPT. And that is God's positioning truth. We always can discover where we are, and we can always get to where God would like us to go as we investigate His story. Have you ever taken a toddler, whether they're your own or your grandkids, or you're babysitting for somebody else, to a mall or a zoo or a big amusement park? Do you know how you feel if they wander off? Ever happened to you? Even just for a minute, they just, just, just for a second. It's why some parents have resorted to those leashes, okay? I hate them, but I understand them, all right? But, but it just panics us. Then as our children grow older, we think it gets better. No, she's 16. And she wanders off with some boy. That's not better. As our kids get older, even two-year-old kids, 
we worry about a different kind of wandering. Wandering into activities that are unhealthy for them. The relationships that prove to be harmful. As they get older, we're more concerned about the wandering of their hearts away from family and away from church. But most importantly, we wonder about them wandering away from God. The truth is, all of us in this room are prone to wander. And this is an Oki saying W-A-N-D-E-R. <laughs> wander, not wonder. All right? You got that one figured out? The truth is, all of us are prone to do it. Some of us will do a dramatic nosedive kind of rebellion into sin. I mean, get caught up in the kind of blatant sins where you kind of shake your fist at God. How could you let this happen to me? There are the kinds of stories that we tend to hear about and we tend to gossip about as well. I mean, you know, the Christian pastor who has an affair, headlines. The church treasurer who runs off with the money. The elder board member who's a part of a pornographer, pornography ring. And by the way, none of those things have happened to our elders and staff here yet. Okay? So don't look around and wonder, who could he be talking about? It's happened, but simply, fortunately for us so far, not here. But others of us, probably the vast majority of us, we wander in far more subtle, however, no less significant ways we gradually, almost imperceptibly, begin to pursue alternatives to full devotion to God. This can take the form of a lot of different things. Out and out laziness that prompts us just to sit and occupy hours upon hours upon hours in front of a television set. We can escape into the various lines of the internet, losing ourselves in conversations and relationships that are meaningless. Some will subtly be drawn away by loneliness and despair with a desire simply just to survive the day. I'm aware of how prone I am to wonder, to lose my focus, my zeal, as John writes to the church in Revelation, lose my first love for him. And this probably happens for many of us most when life is going very smoothly. I don't need to talk to God today. I don't need to check out his word. You know what? I'm, I, I, I've already made it to maturity. I don't need to spend time with God. And yet when I read the story of the children of Israel, I don't know about you, but I get so ticked at these people. <laughs> I shake my head and I say to these people, idiots! And then I walk by a mirror. <laughs> I would like to assume that if I were in their shoes, well, let's say, just, just play with me for a minute. Let's say our whole congregation at New Hope. <clears throat> wouldn't we behave differently than them? I mean, wouldn't we, wouldn't we do better following Moses than they did? I mean, what if it was the children of New Hope the story was about instead of the children of Israel? I mean, wouldn't we trust God better after knowing about the deliverance from Egypt? After discovering the ten plagues and seeing God's handiwork at the Red Sea and the manna in the desert? I mean... Wouldn't New Hopians humbly follow God every step of the way right into the promised land? I believe we would have arrived at least 40 years sooner. <laughs> Wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? Let's suspend that question for a moment. And I want us to look at a pattern that we find repeating itself again and again and again in the story, particularly in the six episodes that were part of Numbers and Deuteronomy that you were reading in the story this week. The pattern essentially is the same. It goes something like this. God provides. It always begins right there. God provides. God provided creation. And he breathed into Adam and Eve the breath of life and they became living souls. That's God calling. You say, pay attention. <laughs> Noah. That wasn't the dismissal bell either, by the way. Just in case you thought it might be. Uh, it was Noah. It was Noah. God provided, build an ark. He provided before the need ever occurred, build an ark, because there's going to be a flood. 
with Abraham and Sarah. He gave them the promise that though they were buried, one day they would have a child and they would be the father of a great nation. With Joseph, what his brothers intended for evil, God provided and used it for good, not only for Joseph, but for this, this, this infant nation of 70 to survive a famine. God provides. And it's first. And then we move into a time with his provision that will either be in the wilderness or in the promised land. God provides. Sometimes he provides in the wilderness. Sometimes he provides in the promise and the prosperity. The Israelites experience both. And in both situations, we're going to see how they chose to respond. I will tell you right off the bat that what we're going to go through, what we're going to explore, is not the preferred pattern of our relationship with God. Unfortunately, it's an all too common pattern. And I find it fascinating to observe how it plays out in the situations and episodes that we read about this past week. In the previous chapter of Numbers chapter 10, before we get to the first episode, we see God's provision again. God says, I am going to guide you, Israel. I will put a cloud in the sky right above you. When it stops, you stop. When it moves, you move. That will be my visible presence for you. And don't worry when it gets night, you won't lose sight of the cloud because that cloud will become a pillar of fire at night. It's going to be your own nightlight. Those of you who are afraid of the dark, don't panic. Those of you who are worried, I'll leave you, don't panic. When you wake up, look up. And what you will see is my presence. It will be there. God's presence every single day, ever good to them. Move, you move, stop, you stop. Last week, we learned about how God made a way for them to exist in this journey by giving to them his law and demonstrating his love. That was so the Israelites could get unstuck from their own trap. And yet, in spite of the provisions and so many more, the children of Israel consistently choose to doubt God and his goodness. Have you ever found yourself in the same place? I have. All right, page 71. In a regular Bible, that's Numbers chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. This is episode 1 of six episodes we'll quickly look at. Here's what we read there. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. This is getting pretty serious. This has gone on again and again and again, and God says there's consequences to your ongoing rebellion. Have you ever said to your kids in the back seat when they're whining, don't touch me, I'm going to pull this car over and I'm going to whoop you kids. <laughs> it's happened. God is now about to say judgment is coming to the house of Israel. Even though the Israelites were being well prepared for, they were focusing on the hardship of the wilderness and they chose, they chose to grumble and complain and rebel and wander away from God. And there are consequences. And that's the next part of the scenario. When we make decisions, there are consequences. Now, guys, that word consequence is often used in a negative thing. We must understand, consequences are not all negative. How many of you go to work tomorrow? Okay, Is there a consequence for you going to work tomorrow? What is it? Payday. Payday. That's a good consequence. All right, it's a wonderful consequence. Payday. Negative decisions, negative consequences. Healthy decisions, healthy consequences. God is trying to reveal this to them. God sends fire to the outskirts of the camp. The people cry out. Moses prays. God relents. They're right back to a place of provision, but it doesn't last long. Episode 2. The very next episode, which feels like a sequel from the movie we've already seen. It's like, um, uh, who's that guy that played for the Yankees? And he always says kind of interesting things. Yogi yeah, yeah, Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra said, deja vu all over again. And that's kind of what we're like in these episodes with the children of Israel, all right? Uh, uh, same song, second verse. This time, their complaints were about food. Usually it's about food or a lack of water. This time... 
The complaint is about a lack of the variety of food. And they start wailing. They are tired of monotonous manna. They are eating every single day. Here's the provision of God. God said every morning when you open your tent flap, right there at your tent flap entrance is going to be manna. Enough bread for you to eat all day long. Just walk to the door. It's there. They probably figured out how to make manna burgers, manna casserole, manna pancakes, manna sandwiches. I mean, they come up with every recipe. And they said, we're tired of manna. Instead of being grateful for the provisions in the wilderness, now they're whining, we want variety. We want something else to eat. Right now, they're thinking with their stomachs and their desire for meat. Right now, they're controlled by lower story thinking. Remember, we've been talking about over the last few weeks, upper story, lower story. Can we live in the lower story with an upper story perspective? Will it change the way in which we live in life? Too often, we make decisions based on lower story and we miss completely the upper story. It's the reason this book was given to us is to enable us to have better insights into upper story truth for lower story living. So, page 72 of the story, which is verses 10 through 15 of Numbers chapter 11, Moses speaks again. The scripture says, Moses heard the people of every family wailing. Each one at the entrance of their tent. They walk out, they see manna, they start crying. The Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was also troubled. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you? You put the burden of all these people on me. Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms to a promised land? Why must I nurse them like an infant to the land you promised? Where can I get meat for all these people? Where's the butcher store, God? I don't know. If this is how you're going to treat me, God, put me to death now. <laughs> Just let me die, God. I'm tired of these people. Mom, you ever felt that way about your kids sometimes? <laughs> Employer, ever feel that way about your employees sometimes? Pastor, ever feel that way about your... Oh, no, I'm... Never <laughs> about the congregation. <clears throat> Notice how both Moses and the followers question God. They're doubting his goodness, his faithfulness, his attention. They completely mistrust that God has good for them. I have to admit, and I bet you did too, that when you read this, you found a little pleasure in seeing how God responded to their request for meat. God, in effect, said, you want meat? I'll give you meat. I'll give you so much meat, and this actually is in the Bible, all right? Page 7, bottom of 72, top of 73, and it says this, I will give you meat until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. Because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, and you have wailed before him, saying, why did we ever leave Egypt. God sends quail, so much quail that in Numbers, that's on page 73, 1132, it says no one gathered less than 10 homers. What in the heck is a homer? I had an uncle homer, but I don't think that's what they meant, okay? According to the research, these people collected no less than 500 gallons of quail. <laughs> You think that's enough to come out the nostrils? <laughs> God was angry and he struck the complaining Israelites with a severe plague. Episode 3. Keep watching this pattern that we're observing as we move from one episode to the other. This one takes place when the people were encamped in the desert of Paran. Now we come to a major crossroads for the Israelites. If this entire story from the Pentateuch were a movie, let's say with Charles and Hessen in it, this scene would be a glorious triumphal climax right here. The people have survived the arduous trek from Mount Sinai to Cadiz Barnea. They now find themselves right on the edge, the cusp of the promised land, the border. They can see it right across the river. <coughs> God instructs Moses to send out spies to check out the land, bring back a report of what it's really like. See, they've just been told it's really good. They've just been told this is going to be home. These spies not only come back with a report, but these spies come back with evidence. They brought a fruit, delectable grape from the land, and they all got to taste it. And they declared, this is a land. 
that flows with milk and honey. But right after the positive message, the report degenerated to a much darker place. The pie, the spies say the land is too difficult to conquer. The people are too powerful. They're too huge. They're too many. They're like giants. And their cities are fortified with great fences. We could never win this land. That was the report of ten of the twelve spies. Only Caleb and his partner Joshua said anything different. And on page 75, verse 30 of Numbers chapter 13, Caleb said, he silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for with God we can certainly do it. But the rest of the spies piled on negativity. They exaggerated the danger. They said they felt like grasshoppers in front of the people that they saw in the land. And this prompted the people to go back to their whining ways, and it propels them to once again wish they could go back to Egypt. And do you understand what that does to the heart of God? What they're saying to God is, I would rather live in captivity under Egyptian dominance than take the risk of living in freedom in your place of promise. Today, that's the equivalent of you and I as Christians saying, God, I'd rather go back and live in sin and face hell than I had to experience what you have in store for me. It crushes the heart of God. Quick question for you. Which team of spies do you associate with? The whining ones? Or the trusting ones? And here's what's important to understand. You just don't impact your own life with the way in which you choose to live and respond to circumstances in life. The choices you make impact others, and often far more than you think. The choice and the response of 10 men impacted over 2 million people. It even impacted Joshua and Caleb, who said the right things and wanted to do the right things. My friends, this is a watershed moment in the entire story of the Old Testament. This brings them to a crossroads. Crossroads. You and I come to them quite frequently. We either trust God or we wander and rebel. At that critical moment, God appears in glory over the tent of meeting. He declares that he's going to strike all of them down and start over with Moses. It's going to be Abraham all over again. Moses, you are now over 80 years old, but I'm going to start a new nation with you because these folks don't deserve any more chances. And Moses sort of stands in the place of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. He says, God, don't do that. Let's give him one more chance. Let's do this again. Remember, God pursues and God rescues. That's his heart. And he says, okay. The faithless spies, the ones who had the negative report, they died right on the spot. Remember that question I asked you a couple of minutes ago? Which group did you associate with? <laughs> which one do you want to be with now? <laughs> God says the rest of the people are condemned to wander in a wilderness for 40 years until that entire generation of complainers and rebels passes away. Their children will then inherit this promised land and enjoy the luxuries of what God has in store for them. That brings us to episode 4. In Numbers 20, God responds to their desire for water by telling Moses, get all the people together, assemble them. And he tells Moses, Speak to the rock in front of them and watch the water pour out. Well, Moses did not follow God's instructions. He acted from lower story thinking rather than upper story perspective. What he does is he speaks to the people and he hits the rock. He would have been far better to have spoken to the rock and hit the people. <laughs> he didn't need to hit anybody. God simply says, speak to the rock. You see, I think Moses is a place of real frustration with these whiners and these grumblers, and he pounds on the rock. Some say, some historians say that this was an act of sacrilege, because the rock was a picture of God 
as our foundation. He should have spoke to it like a relationship rather than feed on it like an enemy. And so, God provides. Moses makes a decision. There are consequences. What's the consequences for not trusting God and obeying Him? Moses, who could have been, along with Caleb and Joshua, as one of his generation to enter the promised land, is now told, you will not enter. You will die before you get there. Later on, God did grant Moses an opportunity to go to a hilltop and see the promised land just before he died. But he would never enjoy the victorious moment of setting foot on that property and celebrating with the nation he had led for over 40 years. The fifth episode involves snakes. And you can read about that in Numbers chapter 21 or from page 80 in the story. The people complain, guess what? About food again. About food again. So God sent snakes whose bite would kill them. The storyteller, <laughs> you might read this right before dinner time as you're giving peas to your children. <laughs> Don't do that because I hate peas too. So. Anyway, the Bible tells that the people repented again and God told Moses, make a bronze serpent. Put it on a pole and tell the people, look up from your bed of affliction, look up and you will live. In other words, get an upper story look. If you stay well on your sickness, if you focus on your illness, you'll die. Look up and live. It is a foreshadowing of what will take place a few thousand years later on a cross. The scripture says, if we lift up Jesus Christ, he will draw all men unto him. Look at the finished work of Jesus Christ on a cross and experience eternal life. There's another part of the symbolism that's there. Anytime you go to a medical office, what's the symbol you see in the medical office? You see the snake on a pole. Its roots are right here out of the scriptures. This is where they look and live. Episode 6, last one. Perhaps the most blatant rebellion is in Numbers 25. By now, the older generation who had witnessed the Exodus had been punished for 40 years. Most of them had died off. Now, wouldn't you think this next generation would have learned from their parents? Maybe their parents would have taught them how important it is to trust God? The young men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who worshipped Baal. They were enticed not only by the women, but by the cult activity of Baal worship. Their behavior was a flagrant rejection of a covenant with God, and God responded by sending a severe plague that would kill over 20,000 of them, 1% of them. There is one redeeming dimension to the story, and it's a, it's a tough one. At one point, a man named Zimri brings one of the Moabite girls into camp and was going to have relationships with her in front of the assembly. And then Phineas, who was a descendant of Aaron, and they were the priests of the nation, he saw this, he grabbed the spear, he drove it through Zimri. And here is where God has something to say about Phineas. He said, Phineas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites. He was zealous for my honor. I did not put an end to them because of his zeal. Ten spies brought bad consequences because of their whining. One man brought rescue to an entire nation because of his zeal for God's honor. Choices we make impacts so many lives. <coughs> Paul understood all of this, and he refers back to these events in his New Testament letter that he writes to the Corinthian church. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says this, Now these things, referring to the stories we're reading about, occurred as examples for us, so that we would not set our hearts on evil as they did. Don't be idolaters. As it is written, the people sat down to eat, drink, and then they got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual, we should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 died. And you're going to say, that's not my problem. Okay, then hang on, and don't grumble. <laughs> you get included in that one? As some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. Aren't you glad you live in a time of grace, not judgment? These things happen to them as examples, written down as warnings for us. 
No temptation has overtaken you except that is common to us all. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way so you can escape and endure it. So after six episodes, what is the way out? What's the way out from temptation, from the wilderness? What's the way out of this pattern of behavior that was true for them and probably true for many of us? How do we give up this propensity to wander off? There definitely is a way. I would suggest to you, most of us will not find it easy. It goes against every fiber of our being. But it's the only way to life and growth and peace. And before we explore God's better plan, let me ask you one quick question. This is just you. This is a question about you, not anybody else. About you. You answer it for yourself. How are you prone to wander? What is it that will prompt you more than anything else to wander from God? Take an honest look at the pattern of your life with God so far. What sins or behaviors or environments most entice you away from Him? What prompts you to lose your passion, decrease your devotion? I think it's essential for us to identify that for ourselves. For some believers, it's quite obvious. Maybe you struggle with lust or greed or selfishness or pride. Maybe you fight the temptation of addiction like alcohol or overeating or a drug. Or maybe it's workaholism or pornography. You battle every day to stay rooted in God's guidelines and His will. Some of you do right away as soon as I ask the question. What's most likely to trigger your wonder? Other of us may have to think a little bit harder about what dissipates our zeal and causes our hearts. For me, it's the busyness of ministry that can lead to the subtle shift of independence from God. Uh, it's, it's just another funeral. It's just another wedding. It's just another hospitalizing. We fail if we're not careful to see each person, each family, each situation. God's opportunity to make a difference. I'm stuck by the insightful writing of C.S. Lewis in his book, The Screwtape Letters. The devil is called Screwtape, and he's training a junior devil called Wormwood, and he's teaching him how to bring Christians down. And he says, one of the best ways to bring Christians down and to draw them away from God is through nothing. Nothing is very strong. Strong enough to steal away a man's ears, not in sweet sins, but in dreary flickering of the mind over it, no knows what, and it knows not why. And the gratification of curiosity so feeble that the man is only half aware of them. In the drumming of fingers and the kicking of our heels and whistling tunes that he does not like, or in the long, dim labyrinth of reveries that have not even lust or ambition to give them relish. But which once chance association has started and the creature is too weak and fuddled to shake them off. Screwtape says later, murder is no better than cards if cards will do the trick. I wonder what he'd say today if Lewis were writing the book today. Maybe he'd say murder is no greater than guitar hero <laughs> if it does the trick to draw us away. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Just because some of us don't fall into the more obvious sins, our hearts are still inclined to be hardened and to wonder. Are you clear about your own tendencies? Where they might be? We can't do battle if we don't know what form our enemy tends to take. We can get lulled away slowly over time. It helps us to return it again and again to what we've been calling the upper story. Get the big picture Lower story. How many of you were here many years ago when we had 34 or 35 consecutive days of fog? Do you remember that? We didn't see the sun. It was 30 some odd days. We didn't see it not once during that period of time. How did we begin to feel? Depressed, discouraged. There's no energy. I remember somewhere towards the end of that, I had to fly to Nashville, Tennessee, and I remember getting on the plane, and we were able to take off, and in just a matter of seconds, we broke through that layer of fog, and all of a sudden, I said, it still exists! There is a sun! I almost cried. <laughs> so emotional. 
Like all of a sudden your spirit's left alive because there was brightness of day. We allowed our life to be influenced by lower story stuff. We had lost sight of the view from the upper story. Remember the grand narrative that we're exploring is the upper story perspective. All right, Tim. We've got to get to the answers real fast. Do an exercise with me real quick. I want every single one of you to straighten and stiffen your neck as hard as you can. Come on. Reach it up. Reach it up. As hard as you can. Okay, stop. Now I want you to do something else. Now I want you just to bow your head. Which one is better? How are you going to respond to God with a stiff neck or a bowed head? A humble heart. That's really the decision of the Israelites made in the wilderness again and again and again. So what's this better way? It starts with a humble heart. And here's the way it reveals itself. Two things. We must be willing to wait and we must be willing to remember. Here's the way out of the pattern that we've seen in the story of Israel. Wait and remember. Browns, aren't you glad the surgeon waited? Yes. yes. It brought better direction. Wait and remember. Hosea 12, 6 says, wait continually for God. One philosopher said, most people prefer the certainty of misery to the misery of uncertainty. They're not willing to wait. I am learning that the deep things of God, the truth of God inside of us, do not happen quickly. When we're in the wilderness, we must learn to wait, to not go ahead or wander off from God. We must learn to develop this waiting muscle. Even when we don't know how to pray, the scripture says the Spirit will pray on our behalf. Now the second muscle, that's the remembering muscle that we need to develop during wilderness times. The book of Deuteronomy is essentially three messages from Moses, and all three of those messages have the same thing. Remember, remember, remember. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, is where this word Ebenezer shows up. How many of you ever have sung the song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing? You remember verse 2, how it started? I know me, and she wanted to bring closure for this little girl. And so, a little girl named Aubrey sat on my lap with a stuffed bear in my other arm and a little book that we read through that talked about God's care for her life at this time. And I received this, and there's a handwritten note that was put in the book, and it says, Remembrance, a book and a bear and a little girl named Aubrey. God's big enough to do what we can. And then one last one, this was given to me, a plaque by the church after 25 years in ministry, and on is a quote from a letter that was received this was a, a, a statement written by Jack Williams. He came and he preached Mom's funeral. He worked Mom's service, you know Jack. Jack was my need of voice and professor in Bible college. And he wrote this in a letter, and they got it and put it on this plaque. It's, and, and I almost didn't bring it because I said, I, it's like patting myself on the back. And no, you need to understand, the reason I put this where I see it every day is to check that as I get older, this is still true. He said, once or twice in every generation, the Lord calls into ministry men and whose fires burn hotter, and whose eyes see more clearly they have been gifted by God. And as I get older, I don't want the damper to come down on the fire. I don't want to burn just as hot and just as white as it did in my younger days. What are your Ebenezer's that remind you to stay in touch with God? If you want less waiting in life, do less wandering. There would have been 40 years less waiting for Israel if they would not have wandered at the brink of the <clears throat> May the children of New Hope, that's all of us, may we be vastly different from the children of Israel. May we choose a different pattern and learn what it means to wait and to remember for the acts of faithfulness of God in our lives. No stiff necks around here, please. In fact, right now, let's all practice bowing our heads. And I want us to pray as we close. I want to ask you, first of all, remember, remember how and why you're most prone to wonder. 
Would you admit that to God right now? Maybe it's not a big, big thing, but it's something subtle, but it's no less serious. Dear Father in heaven, we don't want to be those who are stiff-necked and resistant towards you. We want to learn how to wait. We want to learn how to remember. We want to remember your faithfulness, and we want to wait on your faithfulness. We don't want to follow and mimic the patterns of the children of Israel. But Father, we want to be those children whose hearts are pliable and soft, whose hands are open wide, whose necks are bowed, not bowed. Bowed in humility and submission to your leadership. Father, may we love you more right now than we did last month. And I pray that we will allow you to work in us between now and next month so we can look back and say we love you more then than we do now. We want to be the people who follow you with devoted, full hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Watch out, you're going to read next week. Seven. Seven. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock over there.